Alrighty, so we're looking at how uh, evolution happens. And we're talking about specific little details about natural selection. We know the general principle. Um, and we have just finished talking about a bottleneck. And if there's a bottleneck, and if there's a very small population of individuals, then you can get something that's called genetic drift. Genetic drift is a change in allelic frequency in a population by chance, by randomness, by the luck of the draw, right? So let's just imagine you've got a very small population of flowers, and these are their allelic frequencies. You can see the frequency of the dominant uh, red gene is 0.7, and the frequency of the recessive red gene is 0.3. And then what we're going to do is just close our eyes and just point at five different flowers to kill without looking at them. That would be random. And then you can see that what we ended up with was suddenly we had half of the dominant red gene and half of the recessive red gene. And then we just close our eyes again and we only allow these two guys to survive. And then we find that the population now has lost that allele entirely. Um, one of the things we worry about when we, people who are interested in wild populations of animals like the mountain lions that live in our own uh, wildlands, we worry when they are trapped into such small populations because then they're reproducing with each other and there are small populations and there's a chance of genetic drift and the loss of significant alleles. And what is a significant allele? Well, the truth is you don't know until natural selection acts on it. For example, actually, I'll give you an example in a minute, okay? So that is an example of genetic drift and a bottleneck. Let's look here at what migration is. Migration is the movement of individuals from one population into a different population. Um, now, um, is it really the movement of individuals? Well, technically it's the movement of alleles, but how would alleles just move over a hillside? No, they got to be inside of, a, of an animal, right? So when, when individuals move from one population to another, then we get what is known as migration, and that can change the allelic frequency. Let's just imagine that there is a bunch of squirrels that live on this side of this mountain and a bunch of squirrels that live on that side of the mountain. And uh, the mountains are quite high. And so they are constantly covered at, with snow on the top. So squirrels never go from one side to another. However, um, there just gets to be this, this two winters in a row, two years in a row, where in the summer, uh, there's no snow on top. And so the squirrels are going all the way to the top of the mountain and actually uh, moving to the other population. Uh, when that happens, they bring their alleles with them. Um, which squirrels are going to make the journey? That is probably going to be a matter of randomness. Uh, so it could have been that it was all of these blue allele squirrels that move over, but instead it was this mostly green allele squirrels that moved over, and they will bring their new alleles into the population. Um, we see the influence of migration when we have got um, dogs that are mutts. Dogs that are mutts um, are the result of migration of alleles um, you can think of purebred poodles as being one population of dogs and purebred Great Danes as being a different population of dogs. Uh, Great Danes are bred with Great Danes. Poodles will make it a standard poodle. They're bred with poodles. And so you have got two populations of animals. And the alleles that they have are not just the alleles that make them look like a Great Dane or a poodle. There are all kinds of alleles that went along for the ride. And there are some alleles that can create, well, for example, Great Danes don't live very long. There are probably some alleles that are in their genes that are responsible for that change. Um, if you breed a Great Dane with a poodle, I don't know, what is that called? If you bring a, breed a lab with a poodle, purebred, you get a Labradoodle. 
Um, but I don't know a great date with a poodle. I'm sure someone's done it. Anyway, that would be an example of migration. Um, isolated populations can accumulate adverse recessive traits. They can. Um, for example, like I said, Great Danes don't live very long. Um, they've got it. Uh, boxers. Boxers have got a really high risk of cancer. They've, they've acquired uh, a, um, a high incidence of an allele that makes them very susceptible to cancer. Whereas toy poodles, totally, totally, totally way inbred, but they live a super long time. A little bit the look of the draw because of small population size and founder population effect. Gene mutations. There's a quiz, probably a couple questions on the quiz about this concept, so make a note of it. Gene mutations don't happen frequently. All of the stuff we learned about when we learned about transcription, translation, DNA replication is to prevent mutations. Human bodies in particular, don't animal bodies, don't want genetic mutations. They don't happen very often, but they still will happen. And when they happen, they, they could be lethal. A lot of the lethal mutations, they just create a miscarriage. They can be neutral. For example, I've got blue eyes. It is not beneficial. It's not severely advantageous. It's a little advan disadvantageous, um, but it's considered a neutral mutation. And then there are some advantageous ones. The advantageous ones are not very common, but when they happen, they will be acted on by natural selection. However, keep in mind that nat natural selection uh, changes. And here is an example of human mutation, right? I am not gonna ask you the name of the exact gene, but I do want you to know that we have evidence of human evolution. No, it's not anything cool like you can fly or send bolts of laser out of your eyes. Um, it is this. There, there is a virus called HIV, sorry, called HIV. The HIV virus acts like this. It grabs onto a little protein that's on the surface of one type of your white blood cells. And once it grabs onto that, it'll grab onto this next protein that's also on the surface of your red blood, of your white blood cells. And once it has done that, now it can infect your cells, right? There is a genetic mutation in 1% of people from Northern Europe. Um, it's particularly common in people whose ancestry comes from England. And that mutation is they don't have this protein. It's not there. This is just not there. Until HIV came along, we had no idea that this genetic mutation existed in people. No idea. And why did we have no idea? We had no idea because there was never any reason to go looking for something like that. Because individuals that have this genetic mutation, it turns out that they're slightly more likely to die of some modern diseases, but so slightly that it wasn't worth looking for a specific thing. We only started looking for it when we recognized that there are people who are pretty much immune to HIV. People who got this allele where they are missing that CCR5 gene, people who got that allele from their mom and their dad, meaning individuals who are homozygous for this recessive trait, there is no way for the HIV virus to attack their cells. So they don't get HIV. Now, in the modern world, it, it might be neato to have this particular gene mutation, but in the modern world, there is no reason um, to, uh, that this would end up becoming really dominant in the gene pool. However, if it was, let's imagine it was even 400 years ago. If it was 400 years ago and HIV popped up, then individuals that have this allele situation would be much more likely to survive and their babies would be more likely to survive than people who have this allele. And so if HIV would have happened 400 years ago, probably there would be no humans that would have um, the gene, the allele for a normal CCR5. 
I know that's not exactly exciting, like, oh, you can fly, but it is evidence of human human evolution. Okay. All righty. Yeah, so in the people from Northern Europe, like that's Sweden, right? Sweden, England, Spain, um, Germany and Austria, uh, Poland, uh, even Russia, these people have got a very high frequency of the CCR5 allele. If you've even got one of the mutated alleles, you're less likely to get HIV. But if you are, are homozygous for the mutation, then you pretty much won't get HIV. As a matter of fact, if you're interested in this, read about something called the Berlin patient. The Berlin patient, there's a very nice Wikipedia page about the Berlin patient. You can read all about it. Right? We're going to start here at the beginning of the next video.